We are so glad that you joined us. We love 3 ABN Sabbath School panel. We love studying together and we love it that you are part of our family. Speaking of family, I have some of the family with me. We have all the brethren in Israel today. Mm. To my left, Pastor James Rafferty, glad you're here. Good to be here, Jill. I'm going to be covering the brothers meet Esau and Jacob. Amen. To your left, Pastor John Loma King, glad you're here, Pastor. Yeah, pray for me on this topic. It is the violation of Dinah. Yeah. And it's a sensitive, touchy topic. Yes. It is a heavy I think topic. the way it's communicated will give context to oh, glory to God or so pray for guidance on this topic. Amen. Mm -hmm. To your left, Pastor Ryan Day. Glad you're here, brother. Amen. Always a blessing to be a part of the 3ABN Sabbath School panel. And today I'm covering prevailing idolatry. And last but not least, Pastor John Denzi. Always a privilege to open up the Word of God with you as well. I always, uh, I'm always blessed as I hear everyone share. And I'm covering Thursday, this time, the death of Rachel. Okay. Mm. Before we go any further, Pastor John already mentioned this, that we really need the Lord's guidance mm -hmm. in this lesson. And Pastor John, would you pray for us? Sure. Gracious Father and loving Lord, we open the word, but we pray that we'll also open our hearts. Mm -hmm. Help us to be anxious for only one thing, to hear what the Spirit says to us and through us. We desire to make the lesson clear, mm -hmm. but we pray for guidance from above so that the outcome will be to the strengthening of someone watching and the growth of those who are listening. Mm -hmm. And may we give all the glory to you, we ask in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Last week, lesson number nine was Jacob the supplanter. This is Jacob part one. We discovered that the deceiver became the deceived. Mm -hmm. Did he not? Jacob deceived his father into mm -hmm. obtaining the birthright. And then Jacob was deceived and he thought he was getting Rachel, the woman he loved, and he actually got Leah. Mm -hmm. We see this lesson is Jacob part two, you could say, Jacob to Israel. We're studying Genesis 32 to 35 and the saga picks up right after um, they have left Laban. They are traveling back to Canaan. This is Jacob with his 11 sons at that point and his two wives and their entire flocks and herds and everyone. I wanna ask you a question as we start. Why is the Bible so brutally honest and revealing the flaws of humanity. Mm. You know, I've wondered that many times when I read the Word of God. Why are the bad deeds recorded as much as the good deeds? This week, we're gonna discover that Jacob is terrified of the brother that he tricked 20 years ago, and he's terrified to come back home to Canaan. We're gonna discover that his brother Esau hated him and is coming to kill him. We're gonna discover that Jacob's daughter is raped as Pastor John is going to address and the brothers, Simeon and Levi specifically, wipe out an entire town in their rage or their desire for vengeance. We'll discover that there's still idolatry in Jacob's household. You know, I think the story is not so much about the faithfulness or seeming unfaithfulness of the man. The story is all about our covenant keeping God and the faithfulness of the God that we serve and how God orchestrates events to lead us to repentance because he desires that we would be saved in his kingdom at last. The word of God really, if you boil it all down, is it's about redemption. It is about salvation. Mm -hmm. That's what we find from Genesis all the way to the book of Revelation is a God who loves his people and wants to save them. And that's what we discover this week about Jacob as well. Let's read our memory text. We're in Genesis chapter 32. We're gonna look at verse 28. Genesis 32 verse 28. And he said, your name will no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. On Sunday's lesson, we look at wrestling with God and I've divided the lesson into two portions. The first portion is the setup and most of the setup is largely human work. There is a prayer in the middle of that. And then we get to the second portion of the lesson, which is the actual wrestle with God, Jacob's experience wrestling with God. So let's look at the setup. There's a lot of verses to read here. We're not gonna read them all, but we will cover the concepts there. The setup, I have five steps that I found in the setup is the promise of peace, preparation for battle, 
prayers for deliverance, presence to pacify, and preparation for protection. So Jacob's afraid. He deceived his father, he deceived his brother, he's been separated for 20 years, he knows he's coming back, he knows that he's walking into a trial. And we pick up the story in Genesis chapter 32. I believe that Genesis 32 is a turning point in Jacob's life. Mm -hmm. Before this time, we see that he's really a bargainer with God, is he not? We see when right. he was at Bethel, what did he say? If you are with me, then I will do this. One of those conditional if-then statements. We see his bargaining with God. We see his nature of deception come forward. But here in Genesis chapter 32, we see a pivotal shift or a change in Jacob's life and in his character. Mm -hmm. So let's look at those five steps for the setup. First is the promise of peace. Jacob, first of all, tries to send messengers of peace. He has wealth, he has flocks, he has servants, he has herds, and he's seeking favor, as it were, with Esau. Mm -hmm. But what is the response? We see that in Genesis 32, verse six. The messengers returned, and what did they say? We came to your brother Esau, and he's coming to meet you, and 400 men, Ryan, are with him as well. Amen. So Jacob goes into step yeah. number two in the setup and he prepares for battle. He right. kind of strategizes. How am I gonna save my family? What am I gonna do to save my mm -hmm. family? And he divides them into two groups, does he not? Mm -hmm. He says the people, the flocks, the herds, separate them into two groups because if he gets one group, perhaps the mm -hmm. other group will escape. Then we come to the central point of this five-step process. I think it's the most important and it's the prayer. It's the prayer for deliverance. And if you analyze the structure of the prayer, it goes like this, A, B, C, A, it comes right back to A. Now A, Jacob reminds God of God's promise. We see that in Genesis 32 verse nine. Jacob said, O oh God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, the Lord who said to me, return to your country and to your family and I will deal well with you. So what is he doing? He's praying the word back to God. He's mm -hmm. reminding God, this is what you promised. Mm -hmm. This is what you promised to my daddy and this is what you promised to my granddaddy. Mm -hmm. He's reminding God of the promise in his word. That's A. Then we get to B. Jacob acknowledges his need of God. Mm. That's the next verse, verse 10. I am not worthy of the least of all the mercies and all the, of the truth which you have shown your servant. We see Jacob has stopped bargaining with God and he recognizes his need. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm not worthy, right. I need you. Mm -hmm. Then we come to the C portion of the prayer. This is the next verse. Jacob is honest with God about his fears and about mm. the stuff he's struggling with. Verse 11, deliver me, I pray, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him, lest he come and attack me and the mother with the children. Mm. You know, God already knows your heart. Sometimes we think we gotta be so strong in prayer. We gotta, when we come to God, okay, God, I got it together. No, God knows you're afraid or God knows you're angry or God right. knows you're frustrated or he knows whatever you're dealing with. Be honest with him. Mm -hmm. Now the prayer, remember, was ABC. We come back to A because at the very end of the prayer, Jacob reminds God again of his mm -hmm. promise. We're in verse 12. For you said, I will surely treat you well and make mm -hmm. your descendants as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitude. So it's like a sandwich and on both ends, mm -hmm. he prays the word back to God. Right. Step number four, we see the presence that he gives to pacify Esau. We won't get into it, but it was incredibly generous. Mm -hmm. All these animals and flocks and herds that he sent. And then we see number five, the preparation for protection. Jacob sent his two wives, the female servants, the concubines, the 11 sons over the ford of J Jabok. Mm -hmm. Is that how you pronounce mm -hmm. it? He sent them over for their protection, but Jacob remained alone on that side mm -hmm. of the river. And now we see the wrestling with God. We're in verse 24, Genesis 32, verse 24. Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. Who is this man? Mm. Hosea 12 says it was the angel. Joshua 5 says it was the commander of the Lord's army. Daniel 10 refers to it as the heavenly priest, Michael. Jacob later says, I have seen God face to face mm. and my life has been preserved. <laughs> this is none other than the pre-incarnate son of God. Mm. Takeaway number one, when you reach the end of your humanity, God 
is there. Mm. At our weakest point, God shows up. Take away number two. I think this is significant. God initiated the struggle. You notice it doesn't say Jacob was left alone and he ran up to this man, God, and started wrestling with him. Right. Said um, man wrestled with him. There was a purpose in the wrestling mm. so that he could reach the end of his humanity. He could realize his need for God, his need for dependence on God. Mm -hmm. It was for his character growth. It was for his redemption mm -hmm. and salvation. Verses 25 and 26. Now when he saw he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go for the day breaks. But he said, this is Jacob, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Mm -hmm. Takeaway number three, your opponent is not always who you think. Mm -hmm. He could have thought his opponent was Esau. Esau right. is coming against him and he's terrified of his brother. He's coming with 400 men. Esau was not the barrier to entering the promised land. Esau right. was not the barrier to entering Canaan. Jacob's opponent was himself. By trickery and treachery, by cunning and deceit, Jacob had sought to obtain spiritual blessings through carnal means. Mm. And God was about ready to strip all of that away and show him his true heart and his need of God. Takeaway number four, God touches our strengths to show us how much we need him. Mm. Often we think we're attacked at the point of our weakest point. You think about in wrestling, the hips and legs, is where a lot of the strength would lie. And he was touched in the hip. What does that mean? Often it's our strengths that keep us from surrender. Often it's our strengths that keep us from obedience because we think, I got it together. I can do it myself. But it's in our point of strength where God needs to show us we're even weak where we thought we were strong. Mm. Takeaway number five, victory is obtained through recognition of yourself and your insufficiencies, through the recognition of who your God is and your willingness to hang everything on his word and his promise. God's blessings are obtained when we cling to him yes. in helpless obe uh, right. obedience. And we say, I will not let you go mm -hmm. unless you bless me. And then he says, what is your name? And Jacob said, my name is Jacob. I think stating of his name coincides with his recognition. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Boy, I'm the deceiver. Mm -hmm. I was that guy. He yeah. recognized, acknowledged his sin. That's takeaway number six. And finally, takeaway number seven, allow God to change you. What did God do? Your name's no longer Jacob. Your name is no longer the deceiver. Your name is now Israel. Mm -hmm. Changing name recognized change of ownership mm. and change of the person's character and destiny. Jacob has finally reached the point where he is ready to be changed. And that's where our God can show up. Amen. Amen. Right. Wow. Amen. Powerful. That was a great uh, setup for the Brothers Meet, which is Monday's lesson. My name is James Rafferty, and we're going to be looking at um, Genesis chapter... What chapter are we looking at here? Genesis 33. chapter 33, 33, verses 1 through 20. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. 33, 1 through 20. And we have here the outworking of everything that, that Jill has just shared with us. We have the outworking of this preparation that Jacob may, may, makes to meet his brother. And as he makes this preparation and he gains this victory over himself through um, the wrestling with Christ, the wrestling with the angel, um, everything else falls into place. And that's, that's what the Bible teaches us about this journey that we're on, this journey of salvation, that when self is dethroned, when self is defeated, when self is surrendered, everything else falls into place. And a lot of times we wrestle with sin and we wrestle with temptation yeah. with self all alive. And that's why <laughs> it's such a struggle because yeah. you know, self just wants all of that. But once self is dethroned, there's, there's no struggle with sin, where there's no struggle with temptation because it's clamoring after someone who is gone, who's dead, someone who isn't answering the, the door. Mm -hmm. So Jacob, we pick the story up here in uh, Genesis chapter 33 in verse one, Jacob lifted up his eyes and he looked and behold, Esau came and with him 400 men mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he divided the children unto Leah and unto Rachel and the two handmaids. So 
Jacob is going now from a place where he sees the face of God. That's Genesis 32, verse 30. Peniel, mm. the place where he had this experience with God. Jacob moves now to meet his brother. And, you know, there's been 20 years of separation. And when Jacob sees him coming with 400 men, you can imagine Jacob is worried because the last thing that he remembers with his relationship with his brother was fleeing for his life. His brother was, had promised, I'm going to take you out. And so he prepares himself and his family. He starts dividing them up. He divides children, the children with, unto Leah and the children unto Rachel and unto the two handmaids, verse two, 2. And he put the handmaids and the children foremost, that is, uh, there's a succession here that is kind of revealing to us. I mean, when I think about our humanity, you know, right. we think about, um, I don't know, the best place, best way to illustrate this might be uh, when I used to eat uh, my food, I would always save the best for last. <laughs> so my mom would give me the vegetables, you know, and when I've got the vegetables on my plate, you know, I tried a few times to feed them to the dog. Um, under the table, but that didn't work because the dog didn't like him either. And so they ended up on the floor. My mom was really <laughs> upset then, right? So I would try to eat all the vegetables first. And then hopefully, you know, I could eat the rest of the meal and that would take the taste of the vegetables out of my mouth, save the, the best for last. It seems like that's what Jacob is doing here. He puts the handmaids and their children foremost in the front. Mm -hmm. Leah and her children, remember, Leah wasn't as loved as Rachel. Leah and her children after the handmaids. And then Rachel and Joseph at the very end, like the best for last. Like, <laughs> I want to protect them the best. And mm. he passes over uh, before them. Now, that's... To me, that's the redemption. We've just talked about how he wrestled with the angel and he prevailed and he's, he's become Israel now. So yes, we've got the handmaids and the children in front and yes, we've got Leah next and yes, we've got Rachel and Joseph behind. Mm -hmm. But guess what? Jacob goes in front of all of them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Jacob's in front that's of all good. of them. And this is a picture really, if you will, of Christ. Christ right. has placed himself in front of all all of humanity mm -hmm. and he has taken the wrath of the enemy the wrath that really belongs to us mm -hmm. the wrath that we really deserve he's taking that all he's taking that on first mm -hmm. he's going to confront that first and what's really amazing and we see this in the story because it's a great illustration is Christ takes on the wrath of our enemy and there's nothing left for the rest of us mm. in other words Christ Good. has taken out the second death That's right. for us mm -hmm. and those that trust in Christ will not be hurt the Bible says in the book of Revelation will not be That's hurt right. of the second death so you see an analogy here you see a picture here of the plan of salvation and you see Jacob putting himself in front of all of them he passed over before them and he bows himself to the ground the Bible says that Jesus Christ humbled himself in Philippians chapter 2. It says he bowed himself to the ground seven times. And if you follow Hebrews chapter 2 very carefully, you're going to find seven steps of Christ humbling himself down to the point of dying the death, even the death of the cross. So the type is here in Jacob. He bows himself to the ground seven times until he came near unto his brother. So Jesus came to this earth. He humbled himself. He came near to us. He became one with the human family. And what happens? Esau ran to meet him, mm. embraced him, fell on his neck and kissed him and they wept. Hello, prodigal son. The return of the prodigal son. <laughs> so you see here in the picture of Jacob and Esau, you see again this picture of the plan of salvation. Yeah. You see the humility of Jesus Christ in our behalf to protect us, to redeem us. And then you see the response of the enemy of right. Jacob, or the enemy of humanity. You see that our enemies can be reconciled to us as we humble ourselves and reveal the character mm -hmm. and the spirit and the grace of Jesus Christ. And of course, this picture of the prodigal son is beautiful. And so verse five, he lifts up his eyes and he saw, this is Esau, he saw the women and the children. He said, who are those with thee? You know, because when Jacob left, he was by him. He was all alone, right. right? Who are those with thee? And he said, the children which God has, here's the word, are you ready for this? Graciously given thy servant. Mm -hmm. Oh man, well, if you remember our last lesson and you want to read Genesis chapter 29 and chapter 30, it was anything but gracious in a sense. I mean, all the and the envy and the jealousy and the hate that was going on there between Leah and Rachel, you know, and then the handmaids come into it because we don't want to be outdone by one of the others. And yet Jacob here in his converted transformed state says, these are the children which God has graciously given because in spite of the envy, in spite of the jealousy, 
actually God came down and he blessed. Yeah. He blessed right. Leah right. and he blessed Rachel and he blessed Bill. He blessed the handmaids. God blesses humanity even mm. in our dysfunction, mm -hmm. even in our failures. Then the handmaids came near and they and their children, they bowed themselves and Leah also with her children came near and they bowed themselves and after came Joseph near with Rachel and they bowed themselves and he said, what meanest thee this by all that drove which I met? And he said, I've sent these to find grace in thy sight, my Lord. This is amazing how Jacob is relating to Esau. And Esau said, I have enough, I have enough, my brother. Keep what thou hast unto thyself. And Jacob said, no, 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 I pray you, if I found grace in thy sight, then receive my present at my hand. For therefore I have seen thy face as though I had seen the face of of God. Now, mm -hmm. this is a really powerful point right here. Yeah. And, it, and even the rest of the, the outline here, we're not going to go through it all. Just grace, grace, grace all the way through it. But the quarterly brings out an important point here that I think we should really focus on in its application to the plan of salvation. Jacob bows himself seven times before his brother, whom he calls several times my Lord mm -hmm. and identifies himself as his servant. Significantly, Jacob's seven bows echo his father's seven blessings, which he had received, you know, in Esau's place. And furthermore, when he bows, he specifically reverses his father's blessings about the nations bowing to you. So it's as though Esau, Jacob is returning to Esau the blessings that he deceived and took and stole from Esau. That's, that's nice. And he is reversing the blessing or the uh, statement that was nations will bow to you. He's bowing to Esau. Jacob is bowing to Esau. It's as if Jacob's intention was to pay his debt to his brother to return the blessing that he had stolen from him. So when Esau saw his brother against all ex expectations, he ran to Jacob and instead of killing him, <laughs> he kissed him and they wept. Hmm. Yeah. This is the power of grace. This is I the mean. power of mm -hmm. reconciliation. And then later Jacob comments and says, I have seen your face as though I had seen the face of God. And I'm just going to be honest with you. I struggled with this. What, what do you mean Esau's the face of God? Jacob, aren't you going a little bit overboard here? I mean, aren't you really <laughs> trying a little bit too hard here to appease, right? But notice the point that the, the quarterly makes, and I think it's so good. The reason for Jacob's extraordinary statement is his understanding that Esau had forgiven him. Mm. Amen. The Hebrew word, ratzah, pleased, is a theological term referring to any sacrifice that is pleasing or accepted by God, which then implies divine forgiveness. Mm. Mm. So Jacob, Jacob was saying, I see your face as I see the face of the Lord because he had already experienced the forgiveness of the Lord. Right. Mm -hmm. And because Esau had ran to him and fallen upon his neck and kissed him, he was experiencing the forgiveness of Esau. And he says, sure. this is just like the experience I had with the Lord. And so I see you as I see the Lord. And friends, really that's the bottom line for each one of us. God wants to be so gracious to us and touch our hearts with such power and love that people who see us, mm. especially people who perhaps are afraid of us, afraid because they've mistreated us, mm -hmm. would see in us the forgiveness of God. That's mm -hmm. why we're here on this earth. That's the purpose, that's the, the commission of the Church of Christ is to, through us, reveal God's goodness and God's grace and God's forgiveness. Amen. 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 I love oh. that, Pastor James. That's powerful. Forgiveness, healing, and reconciliation. Don't go away. We have so much more for you. We'll be right back. Ever wish you could watch a 3ABN Sabbath School panel again? or share it on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. Well, you can by visiting 3abnsabbathschoolpanel.com. A clean design makes it easy to find the program you're looking for. There are also links to the Adult Bible Study Guide so you can follow along. Sharing is easy. Just click share and choose your favorite social media. Share a link. Save a life for eternity. Welcome back to our study of Jacob turned into Israel and we're going to kick it over to Pastor John Lobacane in Tuesday's lesson. Wow. One of the toughest chapters in the book of Genesis is mm -hmm. chapter 34. Mm -hmm. We've talked about deceiving mothers, biased parents, mm -hmm. brothers who are hungry and willing to give up what they could receive as a blessing from the father to carry out throughout their generation. We've, we've read about deception in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve being deceived. Now we come to a a part of the story, and I think there's a question that you asked earlier, Jill, mm -hmm. that really shows, and I think one of the reasons that I can cite that the Bible is not written by man is it points out the worst in us. Yeah. Mm. 
It points out the worst in us so that we can see the best in Christ. Amen. That's and great. so if you would ask, this, ask yourself the question, is there anything about us that's good? <laughs> Just read Genesis. You don't have to read the rest of the Bible. Right. Just Genesis established yeah. a cadence that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately, desperately wicked. Mm -hmm. And then it ends with the question, who can know it? Mm -hmm. And so this is one of those stories that it starts out by the land where uh, where Jacob settles and he settles among a people that he doesn't know as well. They are not committed to God. And it's a, a people based on what we're going to read here that have, um, that have no control in this particular story. Um, Shechem has no control of his faculties mm -hmm. and he allows his eyes to cause his flesh mm -hmm. to sin. And so we're going to walk through the story Rather than just making points, I want to walk through it specifically because, um, and then I'll, at the very end of it, highlight uh, Simeon and Levi. But the violation of Dinah opens the door to remind us that um, this is not a new sin. Yeah. This has been going on for millennia. Uh, men, uh, unfortunately, exercised among many men, uh, looking at the beauty of a woman and thinking that because she looks beautiful that he can take her by force mm -hmm. and think that his actions are justified by his passions. And the Bible mm -hmm. shows that um, not only in this story will you see that whatever you sow, you're going to reap, mm -hmm. but you'll also see the aspects of how God looks at humanity that puts him or herself in this category. Today, we have something in the world called human trafficking. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it falls in line with this kind of story. Uh, women being snatched and kidnapped and sold around the world and bartered as though they are a piece of property. Mm -hmm. And you will see in this story that God, that at a time where, and I, I say this, at a time where Jacob could have put his best foot forward, it's kind of, I asked myself the question, where was he when he could have done mm -hmm. more? Absolutely. So let's start with verse one to six, the violation of Dinah. We're going to walk through every verse in the story. Now, Dinah, the daughter of Leah, whom she had borne to Jacob, went out to see the daughters of the land. And when Shechem, the son of Hamor, the Hiveite, prince of the country, saw her, he took her and lay with her and violated her. His soul was strongly attracted to Dinah, the daughter of Jacob. And this part is not agape love. This is carnal love. Mm -hmm. And he loved the young woman and spoke kindly to the young woman. That was more of a, that was more not, not speaking to her respectfully, mm -hmm. but speaking to her uh, 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 suggestively. Yeah. yeah, he said, you know, uh, nowadays we, in the city, when you're growing up in New York, they're rapping to her. You know, I, how you doing? You know, trying to find his way in, mm. which is a sad reality. And it says, goes, goes on. So Shechem spoke to his father Hamor saying, get this young woman as a wife. And Jacob heard that he had defiled Dinah, his daughter. Now his sons were with his livestock in the field and Jacob held his peace until they came. Then Hamor, the father of Shechem, went out to Jacob to speak with him. Now, at this point, I should have said, Jacob didn't have to wait till his sons came in. Mm -hmm. As a father, he, he should have taken the lead right here and called his sons in and say, here's what happened to Dinah. We need to take this matter into our hands and approach this family about what just took place. But he waited. And I think that hesitation to me, he held his peace. And I, I don't understand the reason why he held his peace, but the Bible says that's what he did. But this next part, uh, which it shows me that we should not look at women as comparable to property. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Because that's what this part says. If I could just give you some land, right. would this be okay? I mean, just, I just raped your daughter. I just raped Dinah. If I, if I give you this property, would that be cool? So look at this. It's, very, it's a minimization of her value. Mm -hmm. And I want to say this. Don't ever look at a woman regardless of what you think about her. Don't ever look at a woman as though her value is just comparable to something that can be traded for the violation of her body. Mm -hmm. Verse 6 to 12. It's a sad story. Then Hamor, the father of Shechem, went out to Jacob to speak to him. And the sons of Jacob came in from the field when they heard it. And the men were grieved and very angry because 
he had done a disgraceful thing in Israel by lying with Jacob's daughter, a thing which ought not to be done. But Hamor spoke, to him, spoke with them saying, the soul of my son Shechem longs for your daughter, right? trying, to, trying to fix it up. Mm -hmm. Please give her to him as a wife. Why, why couldn't you ask that before? Mm. And make marriages with us. Give your daughters to us. Now he's expanding. <laughs> and take our daughters to yourselves, sons of God, daughters of men. Mm. Mm -hmm. So you shall dwell with us, and the land shall be before you. Dwell and trade in it, and acquire possessions for yourself in it. Then Shechem said to her father and her brothers, let me find favor in your eyes, and whatever you say to me, I will give. Ask me ever so much dowry and gift, and I will give according to what you say to me. But give me the young woman as a wife. In other words, whatever you want, you can have it, but I just want her. Mm. And this, this kind of, rather than any repentive spirit even saying, you know, I am so repentant of what I did to your daughter. What can I do to show my repentance? He just went on to just property right. exchange. Yeah. Very sad. But look at the brothers. Verses 13 to 24. The frustration of Simeon and Levi. But the sons of Jacob answered Shechem and Hamor his father and spoke, deceit and spoke deceitfully because he had defiled Dinah his sister. And they said to them, we cannot do this thing to give you our sister. Give our sister to the one who is uncircumcised for that would be a reproach to us. But on this condition, we will consent to you. If you will become as we are, if every male of you is circumcised, then we will give our daughters to you and we will trade your daughters to us and we will dwell with you and we will become one people. But if you will not heed us, if you will not heed us and be circumcised, then we will take our daughters and be gone. Now, I don't want to go through the rest of the story, but what they're in essence saying, and they knew in their hearts that this is not what they were going to do. They, they had other plans, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but they wanted to, they wanted to disseminate their, their anger among the entire uh, 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 group of people to, to cause them to go through these rituals just to, in some sense, as a demeaning act. Right. But they had no intention of allowing those actions to become equal payment mm -hmm. for the violation right. of their sister. And then we find the vengeance of Simeon and Levi, verses 26 to 29. And they, now, by the way, they, 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 they followed all the requirements. Mm -hmm. But the Bible says in verse 26, and they killed Hamor and Shechem, his son, with the edge of the sword and took Dinah from Shechem's house and went out. The sons of Jacob came upon, the sons of Jacob came upon the slain and plundered the city because their sister had been defiled. They took their sheep, their oxen, their, their donkeys, what was in the city and what was in the field and all their wealth and their little ones and their wives they took captive and they plundered even all that was in the houses. Mm. They said, we're going to rake the city. You did that to our sister. This is the vengeance. And you know, I don't agree with either side of that. Wow. Mm -hmm. But this act was so vengeful. That's why you find later on in Genesis chapter 49, it speaks of Simeon and Levi as instruments of cruelty. Mm -hmm. uh, Genesis 49, 49 verse 5, they were instruments of cruelty. But here's the part of the story that really bothered me. It seemed as though Jacob just kind of let it go because look at verses 30 and 31. Then Jacob said to Sim Simeon and Levi, you have troubled me by making me obnoxious among the inhabitants of the land, among the Canaanites and Perizzites. And since I am few in number, they will gather themselves together against me and kill me. I shall be destroyed, my household and I. But they said, should he treat our sister like a harlot? That's what Jacob should have been saying. <laughs> right. But he was more concerned about his reputation when he should have been <laughs> defending the reputation of his daughter. Right. And the sons never, now I don't agree with their, their murderous uh, actions, but they had more compassion for what had happened to their sister right. than Jacob did. And I'll give my closing comments on the last two minutes. What a story. That is the reality that the Bible shows even the darkest side of humanity. Mm -hmm. Wow, wow. Whew, I almost need a moment just to, just to <laughs> get my thoughts together after that. It's, a, it's one of those stories that's hard to take in. But, um, but praise the Lord, we serve a gracious God. Mm -hmm. That even beyond our darkness and our 
frailties and, and our mishaps and all of our issues that we have. We serve a mighty God who is gracious and forgiving. And my name is Ryan Day, and I have Wednesday's lesson, which is entitled Prevailing Idolatry. And uh, I'm going to be jumping right into the first verse of Genesis chapter 35 because uh, this now, now there's about to take a, a, another, another turn, another change in the camp of, of Jacob. And I just have to ask this question. Does God accept us as we are when we come to him? Yes. yes, he certainly does. In fact, we hear that a lot. You know, God accepts you just as you are. And that is so true. We serve a loving, kind, gracious, wonderful God who accepts us just as we are. When we come to him with all of our problems, with all of our, our issues in our life and, and all of the backwardness from his character, he accepts us just as we are. But as we're about to read, he does not leave us and he is not, he is not determined to leave us the way that we are. God is a changing God. He is That's a right. transforming God. And so here are what we have in Genesis chapter 35. I'm going to begin in verse 1. It says, Then God said to Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel and dwell there and make an altar there to God, who appeared to you when you fled from the face of Esau, your brother. And Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, Put away the foreign gods that are among you. Purify yourselves and change your garments. Mm -hmm. Let's, uh, then let us rise and go up to Bethel and, and I will make an altar there to God who answered me in the day of my distress and has been with me in the way which I have gone. So they gave Jacob all the foreign gods which were in their hands and in their earrings which were in their ears and Jacob hid them under the uh, terebinth tree which was by Shechem. And they journeyed and the terror of God was upon the cities that were all around them and they did not pursue the sons of Jacob. So Jacob came to Luz, which, that is Bethel, which is the land of Canaan. He and all the people were there with him and he built an altar there and called the place El Bethel because there God appeared to him when he fled from the face of his brother. Now, Deborah, Rebecca's nurse, died, and she was buried below Bethel under the tabernacle tree. And so it goes on to say, so the name of it was called Elon Bakuth. The God appeared, then God appeared to Jacob again, and he came from Padan Aram and blessed him. And God said to him, your name is Jacob. You, uh, your name shall not be called Jacob anymore, but Israel shall be your name. So he called his name Israel. And so what we see here is that God, you know, he's dealt with Jacob, right? He's brought Jacob into, you know, he's had a personal experience. Jacob has had a personal experience with God, but now God is going to get the rest of the camp. And he's saying now, come back to Bethel, make an offering to me. But now we see here that Jacob tells the camp, he says, look, if we're going to go up and we're going to have an encounter with God, we're going to extend worship to God. We're going to be in God's presence. You got to make some changes. You got to change your garments. You got to get rid of these false idols because only God, him, we serve alone. So it's not enough to make a physical move from one place to another or from one church to another and expect God's blessing while there are idols still in our lives. That's the point we're going to bring from this. Mm -hmm. Some of us are still cherishing idols in our hearts and God cannot give us a new name as he did Jacob, okay. Jacob to Israel. God cannot give us that new name, that new uh, identification in him unless we surrender all to him. That's the purpose of these verses. Uh, it, it's not so much that we clean up to come to God, but rather God, when God calls us, he accepts accepts us as we are, but yes, there is a cleaning process that God requires and that God will do in you and in those who are willing. I love Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 to 7, again, on this idolatry uh, theme. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 7, notice what the Bible says. It says, if then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God, set your mind on these things above, not on the things of the earth. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is our life appears and you also will appear with him in glory. And then notice verse 5 here. Therefore put to death your members which are of the earth. And then he gives the list here. Fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things the wrath of God has come 
coming upon the sons of disobedience in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. In this case, we know that God wants to, he wants to be the sole God in your life. Mm -hmm. He wants to be the only person, the only power that you idol. God is your God and nothing else. He is a jealous God and there will be no more other gods in your life if he is going to be in your life. That's right. Uh, you know, there's many different ways and I just want to kind of get practical here for a moment in the, in the remaining moments that I have. There's many different ways, uh, and different aspects in which we allow idols to creep up in our life. And uh, I'm going to just, if I have time, I have about eight different aspects here that I want to mention that are, that's going to make it practical. That's going to make it meaningful for our time. Uh, I, the first one that came to mind as I was preparing this lesson was your identity. Some people allow their identity to become an idol. Yes. You see, we have largely abandoned who we are in Christ and placed our identity in other things, whether it be our social media following or our position at work or our abilities or our skills or the achievements we are after. Many have left their identity and, and they're wrapped up in the wrong things. Where is your identity? Is it in Christ? Is it in yourself? Is it in other things of the world? Where is your identity? Don't allow that identity become an idol and push you or draw you away from the Lord, but rather your identity in Christ alone is all that matters. The second thing, have you allowed money and material things, the things of the world, to become an idol to you? This is a big one. First Timothy chapter 6, verse 10 comes to mind when I think of this because it says, For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, for which some have astrayed from the faith, it says, and their, and their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. We live in a world today where people chase. That's what they live for. They live to make more money, more money, more money, more money. They want more wealth, more wealth. And this greed, this desire, this covetous heart has led them to idle the mammon of the world, the things of the world, the money, the material things of the world in which all is going to burn before Christ comes back. Where is your heart? Have you made that an idol in your life? Because I promise you, no matter how many mansions, no matter how many cars, no matter how many, uh, you know, how much, how much bling bling you may have on your body, when Jesus comes back, it's all gone. You're not taking it to heaven with you. The Bible makes that very clear. Do you allow your job, your status, your career to become an idol? Uh, lives and homes being destroyed because of selfish gain and status and over a title or career. It's so sad because we live in a world today where families are so segmented and broken and, 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 and torn apart because we have selfish individuals who are more interested and more into their career, their job. And please don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that a career is bad to have. I'm not saying that you shouldn't have a job. A man have to work, right? We have to pay the bills. But certainly don't allow that career, that job, that, that working status to become the idol in your life where that becomes the one thing that you give most of your time, your resources, and your love and your attention to when obviously God should come first, then family, and then everything else. Mm -hmm. Do you allow your physical appearance to become an idol in your life? Mm -hmm. uh, this is a big one. Uh, what, what, what do we see right there in the verses that we read in Genesis 5 verses 1 through 10 there? What, what, did, he, what did he address? Not only to, for them to put away their idols, but he said, change your garments. Mm -hmm. Take off your earrings, your jewelry, and all these different things. When you're going to approach God, God wants to make a change in your life. He accepts you just as you are, but he doesn't leave you as you are. Your heart, again, this is Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 17, speaking from Lucifer's perspective. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. Even the devil himself, the devil himself had more bling than anybody could ever imagine on all the face of the earth. And the Bible says all the precious uh, stones were his covering and it corrupted his heart because he made himself and his beauty, his appearance, an idol. Don't allow that to be you. That's right. Put God first. Entertainment. Has your entertainment become an idol? Social media, streaming services, sports, worldly concerts, music, all of these things. I'm not saying all of these things are bad in and of themselves, but at the end of the day, we have to make sure that we don't allow the technology and the entertainment, especially in today's time, to become an idol in our life. Did you know you could possibly make comfort an idol? While comfort is not a bad thing, it can be dangerous when it becomes our main pursuit of life. Mm. When comfort is an idol, we will struggle when God calls us to something more difficult. Is there a time of trouble coming? Mm -hmm. Is there a time of great testing coming? Absolutely. Where are you, my friends? Are you in Christ or is your heart somewhere else? Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And I mentioned this kind of earlier, it kind of goes along with entertainment, but also technology. Talking about computer, we live in the age of computers and phones and tablets. You know, addiction to screen time mm -hmm. when our lives revolve around how many likes we get and what, what our following looks like. And if we can't sit in silence for five minutes without refreshing our news feed, we might have a problem. <laughs> you know, these are issues we really have to take to the Lord. What is your, do you have an idol in your life? Seek the Lord, pray to the Lord and say, Lord, search me, O God, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Ryan. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. What a blessing it's been so far. This lesson seems to have uh, flu. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I have Thursday's portion. My name is John Dinsey, and the title for Thursday is The Death of Rachel. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, in chapter 35, verses 15 to 29. Several events take place that have impacted the life of Jacob and his family. And among those, you see that Jacob's last son is born. Uh, a, a bitter experience, Rachel dies. Another bitter, bitter experience when Reuben, Jacob's firstborn son, sleeps with Jacob's concubine. Yeah. And uh, we won't have time to get to it, but the death of uh, Jacob's father, Isaac. Mm. Now let's go to uh, Genesis chapter 35, verse 14 and 29, uh, beginning in verse 14, actually. So Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he talked with him, a pillar of stone, and he poured a drink offering on it, and he poured oil on it. And Jacob called the name of the place where God spoke with him, Bethel, which means the house of God. Mm. Verse 16, then they journeyed from Bethel. And when there was but a little distance to go to Ephrath, Rachel labored in childbirth and she had a hard labor. Verse 17, now it came to pass when she was in hard labor that the midwife said to her, encouraging her because she saw her sufferings, do not fear, you will have this son also. And so it was that as her soul was departing, for she died, that she called his name Benoni, which means son of sorrow. But his father called him Benjamin, which means son of the right hand. Hmm. Now, don't be shaken by this part here where it says, as her soul was departing, because this <laughs> uh, part soul here is the word nephesh, which is about 119 times is translated life. Hmm. And we don't have time to get into this aspect, hmm. but this is merely saying that in her dying breath, she called her son Benoni. As we continue here, uh, verse 19, So Rachel died and was buried on the way to Ephrath, that is Bethlehem. And Jacob set up a pillar on her grave, which is the pillar of Rachel's grave to this day. Now, Rachel was the love of Jacob's life. Mm -hmm. Oh, he loved Rachel so much. The Bible says he worked 14 years just mm -hmm. to marry Rachel. And now, sadly, he has to lay her mm -hmm. in the grave and he set up a pillar to commemorate the place of her burial. And uh, they, they say that there's still some significance as to where she is buried. Now, you'll find interesting that in the book of Matthew, chapter 2, verse 18, Rachel is mentioned again. It says, In Ramah was there a voice heard lamentation and weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children mm -hmm. and would not be comforted because they are not. So Rachel is one of the uh, persons in the Bible that uh, has a prophetic significance. Now, when she was dying, it's interesting that she, you know, she said at one point to Jacob, give me children or I'll die. Yeah. And unfortunately, giving her birth to her second son, she did die. A rather interesting mm. thing that takes place. Now, uh, Genesis 35, verse 21, we go to the next uh, event uh, described there. Then Israel journeyed and pitched his tent beyond the tower of Eder. And it happened when Israel dwelt in that land that Reuben went and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine. Mm. And notice what it says. Mm. And Israel heard about it. <laughs> now, this is a rather interesting thing that happens here. And it's kind of mentioned like, a, oh, by the way, Reuben did this horrible act. And then it just moves on to another story. <laughs> now, the Bible doesn't just do that. Uh, yeah. there, there are reasons why this is mentioned. And I'm going to bring out some things here that uh, you'll find interesting. Uh, when you get to Genesis chapter 49, apparently uh, here in chapter 35, Jacob just he heard about it and apparently did nothing. 
or nothing is at least mentioned in chapter 35. But when you get to Genesis 49, now here in verse 1, notice what is taking place. And Jacob called his sons and said, Gather together that I may tell you what shall befall you in the last days. Verse 3 and 4 is talking about Reuben. Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might and the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity and the excellency of power. Verse 4, unstable as water, mm. you shall not excel because you went up to your father's bed, then you defiled it, you went up to my couch. You see, Reuben was uh, Jacob's firstborn. He had the privilege to be the firstborn son of Jacob. What does that mean? That means that he had the high privilege if he was faithful. Notice if he was faithful to be in the lineage of the Messiah. And uh, notice what happens here in Matthew chapter 1. The lineage of Jesus is mentioned and Reuben should be in that list, but he's not. I'm just going to read verse 1 and 2. Um, Matthew, chapter one, verse, Matthew chapter 1, verse 2 and 3, actually. Abraham begat Isaac, and Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat Judas and his brethren. And Judas begat Pharaoh and Zerah of Tamar, and Pharaoh begat Ezra, and Ezra begat Aram. Uh, here, Reuben should have been mentioned, but he lost the privilege to be, uh, receive the blessing of the firstborn. Mm. And he's not in the lineage of the Messiah. And notice what it says in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 4. For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. Is it possible that oh. Reuben should have been there? He lost the privilege to be the, receive the blessing of the firstborn son. In the book, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 236, it says the crowning blessings of the birth, birthright were transferred to Judah. The significant, significance of the name which denotes, pray, denotes praise is unfolded in the prophetic history of the tribe. He lost that privilege because of the crime he committed. Mm. The, uh, also in Patriarchs and Prophets, 177, it says uh, they were taught to regard the birthright as a matter of great importance, for it included not only the inheritance of worldly wealth, but spiritual preeminence. He who received it was to be the priest of his family. And in the line of his posterity, the redeemer of the world would come. Very important. On the other hand, there were obligations resting upon the possessor of the birthright. He should inherit the ble its blessings, must devote his life to the service of God. Like Abraham, he must be obedient to the divine requirements in marriage, in his family relations, in public life. He must consult the will of God. And so he lost that privilege because of that horrible crime he committed. Uh, now, uh, the book of Genesis chapter 35, beginning in verse 22, something marvelous happens. It just mentions the sons of Jacob <laughs> as he is he going back to his father's land. Very interesting because what happened to Jacob as he was leaving his father's? He left with a staff, probably some water and something to eat. But now he's returning with a huge multitude of people and great wealth. The Lord had, had blessed him mightily. And uh, uh, he had repented. He had become, mm -hmm. he, his name was changed from yes. Jacob to Israel. And so it is that Jacob uh, was able to come into his father's house with great blessings. Now, uh, the last part of Genesis chapter 35 records the death of one of the patriarchs named Isaac. Beginning in verse 27, then Jacob came to his, father's, uh, I, to his father Isaac at Mamre, or Kirjah Arba, that is Hebron, where Abraham and Isaac had dwelt. Now the days of Isaac were 180 years. Mm. Wow. <laughs> One of the last individuals in, in the Bible to live that long after the flood. So Isaac breathed his last and died and was gathered to his people, being old and full of days, and his sons Esau and Jacob buried him. Mm. Isn't that wonderful that these two uh, sons of, of Isaac that were, you know, Esau said, I, I, I'm going to kill them, I'm going to kill them. But the Lord worked out the, the reconciliation of these two, and together 
they were able to bury their father. Mm -hmm. You know, there are lots of lessons here in um, the book of Genesis from the stories. They're not just stories, they're not entertainment. Mm -hmm. They have valuable lessons. And we see here that some of the things taking place in the book of Genesis have prophetic significance. Mm -hmm. And so read them carefully, ask the Lord to give you understanding of what is there, to glean the lessons, not only to understand prophecy, but to help you, guide you in your life because mm -hmm. those mistakes they made are there to be examples for us that we should be faithful to God instead of making these mistakes and then having to reap the bitter results of wickedness. Amen. Wow. Thank you all so much. It was a heavy lesson this week. Mm -hmm. To me, a lot of it was heavy, but we see the consequences of sin, of walking in the way of our own choosing, but we see the blessing of God and the promise of forgiveness and repentance and reconciliation. I want to give each one of you a moment to share something about your day, Pastor James. Well, the, the lesson that we see with the reconciliation between the two brothers is the same lesson that Jacob learned uh, as he wrestled with the angel. And that was a lesson of grace and mercy and forgiveness. And that grace and mercy comes to us from God in an, a vertical relationship, but then it is to go out from us to others in a horizontal relationship. Amen. You know, thank you. When I think about the story of Dinah, a couple of thoughts came to my mind. When you read Genesis 34, verses 1 to 3, it says, uh, Dinah, the daughter of Leah, uh, went out to see the daughters of the land. And being the only girl in the family at that time, she may have dressed to fit into the crowd, but she was introduced to an environment as a 14 to 15 year old that proved to be too strong for her. And then you see the story says Shechem saw her, took her and lay with her and violated her. And when you study what commentators say about the situation, they say that this would be today what we might call date rape and not a violent rape as was the case with Tamar because later on Shechem expressed how much he loved her, tried to fix it with her family and Joseph consenting to the conditions didn't see this as a violent act. Here's a lesson, 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Do not be deceived, evil company corrupts good manners. Make good choices about your environment. Absolutely. You know, I mentioned that I had eight points. I, I listed seven. Here's my eighth <laughs> one here. You can allow possibly family, spouse and children mm. to become an idol in your life. Um, mm. Obviously we should love our family and our spouse, our children, but Matthew 10, Jesus says, he who loves father and mother more than he loves me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Put your, put your trust in God and put him first in every aspect. Amen, amen. Uh, concerning birthright, this is something marvelous. I found in letter four from 1898, Sister Ellen G. White says, Christ has brought within reach and secured for every man high and temporal and spiritual blessings. This is the birthright of every soul born into the world. If you are faithful, those blessings will be for you. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Johnny, Ryan, Pastor John, and Pastor James. Thank you for sharing. I just want to leave you with one quote this time of Jacob's trouble that I had talked about. We will see at the end of time where you and I can reach forward and lay hold by faith on God and say, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Amen. Join us next week, number 11, Joseph, Master of Dreams.